Hello and welcome back to the second part of God Unfolds the Future. In part one, we looked at how God communicates his secrets through his agents, the prophets. And one of those prophets we're focusing on in this study is the prophet Daniel. We've been examining the role Daniel played in revealing and interpreting a prophetic dream that Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, experienced. In this second part of the study, we're going to unravel the true meaning of the dream and its importance to all human beings living on the earth today. So without further ado, let's pick up with question seven. What was represented by the head of gold of the image? Daniel chapter 2 verse 37 to 38 says this, You, O king, are a king of kings, for the God of heaven has given you a kingdom power, strength, and glory. And wherever the children of men dwell, or the beasts of the field, and the birds of the heaven, he has given them into your hand, and has made you ruler over them all. You are this head of gold. So Daniel made it known to King Nebuchadnezzar that the head of gold on the image was the very kingdom that he ruled over. Now, Babylon was one of the wonders of the ancient world, located in what we now call present-day Iraq, and situated on the banks of the Euphrates River. With its magnificent display of wealth, its beautiful buildings and luxuriant gardens, I'm sure we've all heard of the Hanging Gardens of Babylon. It's also where the Tower of Babel was situated, according to Scripture, and also gave rise to the Amorite people, Hittites, and later the Chaldeans. Now, archaeologists unearthed an object called the Cyrus Cylinder, covered in ancient texts, and is considered to be one of the earliest declarations of human rights. Now, Babylon, at its peak, commanded a vast empire, and in its time would have been seen as the capital of the ancient golden world. Question 8. How would the Second Kingdom, Medo-Persia, compare to Babylon? Daniel chapter 2 verse 39 explains, But after you shall arise another kingdom inferior to yours, then another, a third kingdom of bronze, which shall rule over all the earth. In this verse, Daniel has revealed to the king that there will be another kingdom that will rise up, one that's inferior to Babylon, in wealth and magnificence, but nevertheless, this kingdom will inevitably take over rulership of the vast empire that Babylon has built up over the known world. And we now know this kingdom to be Medo-Persia. Now there's a little side note you might want to check out in Daniel chapter 5, verse 25 to 31, where God told Belshazzar that the Babylonians were to be succeeded by the Medes and the Persians. Now, if you don't know who Belshazzar is, Belshazzar was the grandson of King Nebuchadnezzar. He was also the last king of ancient Babylon. Now, if you've ever heard the saying, I've seen the writing on the wall, that's where this saying comes from. So I strongly suggest that you check out Daniel chapter 5 and get the whole of that story, just to put the rest of this question in context. Let's look at question nine. What part of the metal man represented the third kingdom, Greece? If we read Daniel chapter two, verse 39 again, we'll find our answer where it says, but after you shall arise another kingdom inferior to yours, then another, a third kingdom of bronze, which shall rule over all the earth. Now, according to Daniel in this verse, Bronze is a metal that represents the third kingdom, which we know to be Greece, and that is depicted by the stomach and thighs on the image. There were three significant battles that took place between the Persian Empire and the Greeks. These battles were Arabella in 331 BC, there was Granicus in 334 BC, and then Issus the following year. Now, these battles settled the faith of the Persian Empire 
and established a wide dominion of the Greeks. Okay, question 10. The fourth world empire, Rome, is represented by legs of what? We read in Daniel chapter 2 verse 40. And the fourth kingdom shall be as strong as iron, for as much as iron breaketh in pieces and subdueth all things. And as iron that breaketh all these, shall it break in pieces and bruise. Now in this verse, we can see on the image where the fourth world empire, which we know to be Rome, is represented by legs of iron. Now this verse also offers up some fascinating insight into some very important prophetic aspects of the dream of which we'll uncover a little later on. Right, let's have a little look at what we've learned so far. Now, throughout this dream, God has outlined the history of this world from the days of King Nebuchadnezzar to the end of time. He's also revealed four world empires in succession. Historical records confirms that they were Babylon, which is represented by the head of gold, Medo-Persia, chest and arms of silver, Greece, thighs of brass, and Rome, legs of iron, which was also divided as represented by the feet of iron and clay. And the images of gold, silver, brass, and iron that represent the nations and their kings were successively broken. Okay, moving on to question 11 now. As the feet, part iron and part clay, represented a divided condition, what was to happen to the Iron Kingdom of Rome? We read in Daniel chapter 2, verse 41, And whereas thou sawest the feet and toes, part of potter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided, but there shall be in it of the strength of the iron, for as much as thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay. So at the base of the image, we find the feet. Now, this verse is telling us that the feet is a composite of both iron and clay. Now, common sense would tell us that we can't mix clay and iron together because one is soft and one is hard, thus suggesting that there is some form of division there. So if we look closer at the feet, we know feet are made up of 10 toes, thus increasing the division even further. Now history tells us that out of Rome, we get 10 nations which we know make up Europe. So Europe is represented by the 10 toes. This map is a visual representation of the division that the Roman Empire eventually incurred as its forces went out conquering other nations and assimilating other cultures into its own. Now, between the years of 351 and 476 AD, a series of invasions by barbaric tribes from Northern Europe completely overran the Roman Empire and brought it to its end. These tribes include the Saxons, who were the English, the Franks, the French, Alemanni, Germans, Burgundians, Swiss, Lombards, Italians, Visigoths, Spanish, the Suvi, Portuguese, the Vandals, the Ostrogoths, and the Heroli. Question 12. What statement shows that the old world empires would never be wielded back into one great kingdom? Daniel chapter 2 verse 43 states this. And whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. As established in question 11, we know that iron and clay, they just won't mix, they won't bond. So no matter how hard these divided nations attempt to unite under one great kingdom, this verse reveals a prophecy that explains that these nations will never be able to fully unite. Let's move on to question 13. 
who is to set up a world kingdom in the days of the kings represented by the feet of iron and clay. We read in Daniel chapter 2, verse 44 to 45. In the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom, which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. For as much as thou sawest that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it break in pieces the iron, the brass, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God hath made known to the king what shall come to pass hereafter, and the dream is certain, and the interpretation thereof sure. In part one we saw a little animation where a huge rock was cut out of a mountain. Now, no hands were used to cut this rock out. And the rock then came down and smashed the image into bits. In fact, it pulverized it into dust so that it just floated away on the breeze. Now, this rock is a representation of Christ himself, God, whom, on his return, will set up a new kingdom. And this kingdom could never be invaded or overrun or destroyed by any other kingdom. In fact, this kingdom will break into pieces the other kingdoms and consume them. And as this verse says, it will stand forever. Friends, we've come to the final question of this study. Question 14. When will Christ set up this kingdom? Matthew chapter 25 verses 31 to 34 tells us this. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. And before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on his left. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. So this verse is clear, that Christ will set up this kingdom when he returns with all his angels to free from the bondage and tyranny of sin all whom through Christ have been faithful and endured to the end the temptations that Satan the ruler of this earthly kingdom, along with all his angels, of whom has mercilessly and unceasingly bombarded the peoples of this world. Christ will divide the wicked from the righteous, placing the righteous to his right and those marked for destruction to his left. Friends, on that great and wonderful day when Christ returns, those who have been diligently preparing for his return those whose names will be called forth from that blessed register called the Book of Life, those humble, meek, and faithful souls will be the sheep separated from the goats, the ones sealed and marked to inherit the kingdom prepared from the foundation of the world. You see, man has always looked for a better land where the trials and troubles of this world will be no more whether it's called utopia, heaven, paradise, or something else. Man has longed for a time and a place when sickness, sorrow, and death will be over. In God's plan for this world, there is such a place for the faithful. The Bible says that Abraham, the father of the faithful, looked for that type of home. In Hebrews 11:16, the Bible says, but now they desire a better country, that is unheavenly. Wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. You know, as Christ was dying on the cross of Calvary, there was only one bright spot in his hour of agony. When a dying thief turned to him for salvation, from the depths of his heart, the thief cried out, Lord, remember me 
when thou comest into thy kingdom. And the response that came back was the promise that the thief would be with him in his kingdom. Would you like to make the same request of your Savior? Well, join me in this little prayer. Lord, remember me when you prepare your kingdom. Amen. Thank you for watching God Unfolds the Future. May the Lord richly bless you with knowledge and understanding as you continue to study His Word.